Good morning. I'm Midge Dance, and I'm here to um, update you as uh, the Body of Horizons to uh, what we've been doing with one of our newer ministries. A year ago, we decided that we needed to extend Horizons more into the community of Lincoln, and we started a partnership with Seaman Elementary School called Hand in Hand. And you can see the logo up there. Um, the goal of this partnership is to establish an ongoing relationship with Seaman Elementary to support and encourage the staff and the students. And that's a pretty broad term, and we, uh, we were pretty uh, kind of, where are we going to begin this? What can we do um, to get Horizons involved with this partnership in a school? Um, we started with a school supply drive right after VBS last year. We collected 287 items for not only uh, students at Zeman, but for our, our DZ students here. And this gave the principal, uh, Christy Schirmer, a stock of some boxes of crayons and markers and pencils for students whose families were not able to afford those items so they could have them at home for, uh, for homework and uh, things at home. Um, we also collected facial tissues, because you can imagine how many noses need to be blown in an elementary school as the school year goes along. So we collected uh, facial tissues and purchased 25 timers for the teachers to use in the classroom. So we helped support them with supplies. Um, we knew we could always support teachers with food, because that always goes over well with anybody. And so we started the Zeman Snack Attack. And that is um, once a quarter, Four times during the school year, we um, brought in snacks of, might be cookies, Rice Krispie bars, snack mix, on their work day and uh, made that available to them so they could pick up snack and go back to their room and work. And that was all done by volunteers from uh, Horizons who made the items and took them to the school. Our steering team um, prepared a soup lunch for the teachers in December around Christmas time. And the dessert for that meal were um, cookies that the fusion students decorated. Another way that we knew that we could um, get started with uh, helping them in an easy way was the collecting of the box tops for education. That's something a lot, of, uh, a lot of schools do because each box top is worth 10 cents and it adds up. We were able to collect 1,350 box tops last year, and that translated to $135 of free money for Zeman to use at their discretion um, beyond their, their budget. Um, we also wanted to help some of the uh, needy families in, in the community, and there's a large ELL population. ELL stands for English Language Learners, and these are immigrant families that have come to Lincoln to start a new life, and um, many of these families could, would welcome the support that we provided. And we didn't want to do something at Thanksgiving or Christmas because there are so many community agencies that do that. So we chose Easter to provide turkey dinners. And um, you can see the slide on the, many of the uh, slides there are all of Horizons members picking up the dinners and they delivered them on the Saturday before Easter. We had uh, a turkey, we had rolls, vegetables, um, side dishes that were provided by the Lincoln Food Bank. Um, now, those were our initial ideas. From that, from then on, we were, we were kind of at the will of the Holy Spirit, and we just went where we were um, directed, I guess you could say. Um, one of the things that we did was to respond to the request for volunteers to help with their carnival. And the carnival is held in September, and they borrow our games that we use for our summer palooza, or summer palooza. and so we went and uh, several of the Horizons members ran the games so that the staff and the parents could enjoy the time with the kids. Um, the next month, our high school students volunteered as part, part of their mission work to uh, help with the color run that uh, Zeman does, and you can see slides of that as well. Um, another way, another opportunity presented itself as the weather got cooler. Christy Shermer noticed that some of the kids were showing up at school not dressed appropriately and warmly enough to go out for recess. So we thought we needed a little bit of a help. We could help in that way by setting up a clothing closet. And with the help of an anonymous, anonymous donor from Horizons that gave us a tub of clothing and a, a generous donation from Artifacts, we 
now have a store of, of zip-up hoodies for, for elementary kids and warm socks that she can distribute, as well as we gave them a gift card to Target that she can use to purchase shoes or other items that, that kids might uh, be in need of. Um, requ uh, they also discovered, as the school year got going, that they could use some extra help in some of the classrooms. And so starting second quarter, we had six members of Horizons go into um, Zeman on a regular basis and help with things such as listening to children read, practicing flashcards with kids for math facts, spelling tests, so whatever they needed. And it was a good way to see how the relationship part of our goal to establish that ongoing relationship is in place as these uh, volunteers continued week after week. Um, our last project for the year was in May, and Zeman held a book fair, and, and uh, it was buy one, get one free, and so we were able to purchase 38 books for ELL students. And the reason that's so important is these are, these are kids that are learning English um, for the first time, and they need to maintain their progress over the course of the summer. And some of these families aren't able to, they don't have transportation to get to a library, they may not have the financial resources to buy books, so having a book at home that these kids can read over the summer is, is a really important part of, of continuing their liter literacy. So that is, those are all the things we were able to um, accomplish over the course of the year. And we want to continue, our goal is to continue all of these projects next year. And we would like to encourage more and more of the Horizon staff to get involved, or staff, community to get involved in, in many ways. And, and some of those ways are um, to donate school supplies, Look, you know, within the next month, there'll be a lot of sales on crayons and markers and so forth. Pick those up, and, and we will be doing a, um, again, a joint DZ uh, and uh, Zeman school supply drive. You can cut off box tops for education and put those in the, in the, on the uh, mission table. If you don't know what products contain them, there's a list on the mission table as well. You can volunteer for the carnival. You can volunteer, which will be in September. You can volunteer for what is now called your Show Your Stripes Run rather than the Color Run, which will be in October. And the high school students are going to do this, but we'd really like to get a, a multi generational involvement from Horizons in some of these activities. You could volunteer in the classroom. If you have half hour to an hour a week that you could come in and listen to a kid read, I'm, I guarantee you it's the fastest hour of the week. Um, you could volunteer to deliver turkeys. I'm guessing we'll have between 10 and 15 families that we will be doing turkey dinners for next Easter. And so on Saturday, April 20th, we'll need deliverers. And if you really want to be involved with it, you can volunteer to be on the steering team. This year's steering team was Brian, Brian Clanton, who actually started it, um, Pam Williams and Bartek, Kirsten Wilder, and myself. And um, I really, I just here this morning to praise God and thank Horizons for all that we have been able to do with your support. And, and it's so gratifying to see what we can do when we step out of the walls of this building and into the community of Lincoln. Thank you. I am Pastor Jason. I'm one of the pastors here, your lead pastor at Horizons. And I'm excited to welcome you all, whether you are our guest today or whether you are newer to Horizons or whether you have been at Horizons since uh, the early days and have been leaning into the gospel and been leaning into the mission of the church. Uh, so I want to welcome you and make sure that you uh, know that you are welcome here and that we want to embrace you and welcome you as, as family, that we grow together because our mission, our bread and butter, the thing that we eat, sleep, and we believe about every day is that we are leading all to Jesus to become life-changed, life-changers. So we get to walk with people, and on the way, we get to encounter Christ in a powerful way that changes our lives, unmistakably, to the point that then as He lives in us, we get to see Him living in us to change the lives of others. As you've just seen through Midge and witnessing what this church has accomplished, and many, many other things. So I praise God for that. Again, I welcome you. And, uh, you know, when we vision and ask the Holy Spirit to lead us, just like it says on the wall over there, He does things and He leads us. And it's really cool that our relationship with this Zeman uh, Elementary is that um, the, pre the principal said that every time 
uh, we, you know, there's a couple months or weeks that go by and, and Horizons doesn't do something. Maybe they kind of, you know, forget that, you know, that we're their partner. And then there's a need. And once again, it's Horizons who steps up and is taking care of it. And that the teachers and the, and the parents, and they're like, Horizons did it again? Like, what a cool way that we can take Jesus outside of these walls. This is the huddle. And we go out and we play the game together. Um, as people in Christ. So I want to welcome you to that and celebrate that with you. Um, listen, this is your program that you received as you came in this morning. On the back side of that, there's a worship outline, an opportunity for you to follow along. If you like to follow along with your phone instead, uh, just dial up the Holy Bible app. There's some information about that on here, and uh, everything on here is on there as well. You'll see on the front side of this program that there are opportunities for you to connect and to Take those first steps towards being a life changed life changer. So whether you've been here a week or a year and you haven't had a chance to really connect and be a part of this community in vital ways, this is your opportunity. Take those and share with us that you're here. So uh, all of us, if you've been here a million times before, we like to celebrate that you're here today with us and we also like to celebrate our guests. You'll see other opportunities here besides life groups and things like that on our program. Uh, also, the 3rd of July, we're going to be blowing up stuff. This is our third year that we're going to be doing this. And uh, people around town, one of our staff was in the dentist chair, and the person was saying, where do you work? And he says, I work at a church. And, and the dentist said, uh, which one? And he said, Horizons. And he says, oh, you're the ones with the fireworks. See, we're proclaiming the name of Christ through various ways. And so um, it matters, and it's important, and it's fun. So bring your family. Come celebrate with us. Bring a tailgate. It's a lot of fun. Um, we are in already in our fifth week of our sermon series, Tougher Than Nails. And we have been, through this study, equipping ourselves, equipping our church, equipping our ministry to become more like Jesus. Who is tougher than nails in the way that the enemy, that Satan tried to hold Jesus to a cross with the nails of sin and death. And Jesus proclaimed victory over that, that he rose from the dead, that he overcame death, he overcame sin, and said, I have life and choose to give life to you. So that we, as we grow in Jesus, also become tougher than nails. That as we find his power, find his strength, that we become tougher than nails and are able to stand in the midst of our faith, in the midst of our families, our marriages, our emotional health, our physical health, our example that we set for others, our contributions to uh, the community, our glory to God that we give through the ways that he is leading us. That's what happens when we become tougher than nails, that we equip ourselves to stand strong in the midst of spiritual attack. So if the, the concept of spiritual warfare or the concept of, uh, of spiritual attack or uh, spiritual attack is uncomfortable for you, uh, we welcome you into that uncomfortable space, knowing that uh, we're all a little bit uncomfortable about that. But that's where the Holy Spirit lives most profoundly, is in the realm just beyond our comfort zones. So welcome to life in the Spirit by the way of that. Now on that response card, that prayer card that you have in your program, I've been asking you to ask your questions to me that I can be working with you, I can be actually addressing what's on your heart, what's going on in your life, through this sermon series. So um, we're going to actually start really responding to your questions. If you felt like I've been putting them off, you'll see how this is all coming together. But I want to remind you, a couple of the questions that we got was, uh, what do I do when I have so much to pray for and feel so overwhelmed that I don't even know where to start or what to say? My heart is aching and it hurts so much. Another question, how can I help someone else who's going through an attack? What other scriptures apply to help tackle an attack? What can I do when spiritual warfare is putting distance between me and other family members to the point that they refuse to speak to me? What if my own spouse is so caught in attack that he is the one described in 2 Timothy? What if spiritual warfare is happening right now in my own home every day? So I'm sharing this because these are questions from you, or these are questions from your neighbor sitting next to you right now. These are real questions that we're asking, and I want you to know this and hear this because this sermon series is not an agenda. There's no hidden agenda. There's no intention to manipulate or cause fear or lead us in a certain direction 
because of, uh, uh, because of terror. We're not trying to be superstitious. We're not a church that's not, that like suddenly has fallen over the edge, as some people might say. What we know is that this is real. That we are going through real trials. There are real things that are tearing our marriages apart, our relationships, our families, our health. The things that God intends to be good, we have seen them fall apart. So either we get to be a church that kind of sits in the pond like sitting ducks and, and wondering why numbers of us get, get picked off, or we can actually turn to the gospel and say, what are we going to do in this? So that we, we can stand. We can stand up to this. We have tools. And we can stand tall. So that's what this is all about. So, so far, as we look at these questions that you've been asking, we have defined spiritual warfare in week one. Satan's work to destroy all that is good of God and discredit the cause of Christ. Ultimately, to bring separation between us and God. That's the whole point of spiritual warfare, is to get us away from God, to be broken away from God. And he does that through attacking God's good work and also the cause of Christ. Second week, we talked about learning how to recognize indications of spiritual attack. How do I know when I'm experiencing spiritual attack? To summarize, what we said was that we know when we deeply begin to start turning inward, we isolate ourselves, we turn selfward, we begin to idolize ourselves, we turn against others when hate and segregation happens, and we turn away from God, putting distance between us and our Creator. This is, this is the easy way to know, hey, I'm experiencing attack right now. Third week, we talked about identifying Satan's weapons, and I talked about I could give a whole scroll, a whole list of all the weapons that Satan uses because he's crafty and he'll use anything. Even if it's a good thing, he can use it against you. But ultimately, the tools and strategies that Satan uses are, uh, are in employment to do two things. One, to cause insufficiency in you. Because whenever you feel insufficient, that's when we run after all of these sorts of things and make decisions to build us back up. That's where shame, guilt, fear, envy come in. They cause insufficiency in us that lead us to try to build that up. So we, you know, we, we, go to, we go to status, we go to all these different things. And it also, all of Satan's tools and all of his strategies point towards distorting our perception of truth. What is true becomes blurry, becomes unreliable in our minds, and causes us our downfall. So that's the groundwork. Now all of this is in our uh, prior sermon series. So if you missed these, if you're wondering what in the world I'm talking about, go online. It's horizonschurch.org. Go to the watch button. You can catch up on this. Because otherwise, this foundation isn't going to be yours to build upon as we move forward. Because so far, we've been talking about awareness and understanding. We've been building ourselves up of what this is. And the point of this has been so far that if you want to um, have victory over the enemy or in sports terms, if you want to win over the opponent, you better know a thing or two about the opponent. You better know a thing or two about the enemy if you wish to have that victory over the enemy. Otherwise, we go in blindsided and we, and we get a lot of surprises in the way so we have done that. We have worked to know the enemy well. And now we join the offense. Now we get to go forward and say, I am approaching this. And I'm not going to just wait. I'm not going to just react. But I'm actually going to walk forward when I see things off in the distance that I may circumvent them or defeat them before they become a thing. So we get to join the offense. And um, it's just like the Huskers or hopefully the Huskers of yesteryear. Um, if, if we are always hoping to score through the defense, then the ball game was never ours to begin with. The game was never in our hands. See what I'm talking about in that? You know, that's a superficial example, but it goes deeper than that. So we get to be on the offense. So we're going to get onto the offense here. We're going to open up our manual here. It's, it's scripture. It's God's word. So I invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6 here. If you didn't bring your Bible today, there are Bibles available in the back of the worship center. Grab it, write your name in it because it's yours. Otherwise, follow along on your phone or follow along with the neighbor here. Now, sometimes we say about God's Word that it's confusing or that it's, uh, it's like really conceptual and it's not really talking very literally and how do we understand it. In this particular instance, however, God's 
word is clear for us. He has actually provided what I would actually call like a manual, a step-by-step, this is how we stand against the attacks of Satan. It's right there. It's it's very clear. So we're going to dig into that today. And um, this is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. And Ephesus in its time was the Las Vegas of our time. And so there's a lot going on there, a lot, of, a lot of different messages and a lot of different temptations. So Paul says, in response to his statement, look, we are fighting a battle. This is going on, this is real, this is tearing people apart. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God. Now, by the way, I'm reading from the New International Version because our common English Bible likes to be fresh and relevant. But sometimes when we try to be so fresh and relevant, we actually kind of step away from the original meaning. So instead of unpacking all these words, we're going to go back to the New English, New International Version. Um, and so just hang with me this one Sunday. That's what, what we're going to do here. So Paul says, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. This sounds like my introduction to our sermon series, right? And after you've done everything, that you may stand. So Paul says, put on. Hang on to those words because they're important. Verse 14, then he begins to name our weapons, our tools that we begin. And he says, then stand firm then with the belt of truth tucked around your base, your waist. Then with the breastplate of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So we have the belt of truth. We have the breastplate of righteousness. We have the feet of peace that gives us readiness through the gospel. Verse 16, then he continues, he says, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So he's naming all these powerful tools, and then he finally says, verse 18, to wrap it up, he says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So there we have it. We, we actually have a manual. Things to equip us to give us a standing chance against Satan's attacks. Now, one of the things that you know is that in the weeks coming, we're going to dig into these tools. Um, in fact, for the rest of the sermon series, we're going to dig into these and actually see where the power is in them and how powerful they actually are. But the first thing that we need to do, this is why this sermon is called Gearing Up, is we need to first begin gearing ourselves up. It's like if we were going to go play a football game, if you show up in the middle of the field without some pads and a helmet, there's going to be some serious trouble, to, you know, right? You know what I'm talking about? Um, you show up to the game without your equipment, things are not going to go well. So I have four simple points that I want to share with you from us to begin gearing us up for this response here. So point number one, all from this scripture here, is that the fastest way to weaken an attack or to weaken a crisis is to slow everything down. If you're lost on top of a mountain and feeling like you might die sometime soon, the worst thing you can do is panic and try to scamper somewhere that you thought you once were before. Slow down. Get your bearings. Figure out where you are. Figure out what you have. You made a mistake. People are coming to question you on your choices. The worst thing you can do is try to cover it up and spread and tell lies or make, make false affidavits, all this thing. The best thing we can do is to slow down. There's an emergency. What's the first thing they do in emergency response? Assess your situation. Slow down. There's a misunderstanding between you and a friend or a family member. The first thing we want to do is respond in anger or or hurt. But we're reminded to slow down because Paul is saying, before you run off into the battle, put on the armor. Slow down. Take a moment to get yourself right with God. See and prepare before acting. So that's the first lesson that we learned is to slow down. It disassembles everything that seems so urgent or so terrifying. Point number two, if you really want something to be powerful in your life, this applies to everything that we experience in our lives, but specifically today, the gospel. If you really want something to be powerful in your life, you do 
have to commit to it. I know the C word, it's like one of those four letter words, like, wait, I can't believe I just said that. How dare you? There's young people in here, right? Because we're a culture that celebrates being commitment free. Because commitment means obligation, which means a limitation on our freedom is how we interpret it. But the truth is simply agreeing with something or admiring something will never be enough. It's like you get caught in an accident and you're ejected from the, the front windshield and someone says, were you wearing a seatbelt? No, but I thought, I thought it was a really good idea. You know, or, like, why wasn't your seatbelt on? Well, I admire my seatbelt. Wasn't that enough? Like, uh, exercise. You know, when we begin to experience health concerns in our lives and the doctor said to ex- exercise and they say, hey, have you been exercising? No, but I really a- admire exercise. It's a great thing. It's never enough. Now, the col- our culture is anti-commitment, but the truth is, is there is fruit within the choice of commitment that you can get no other way, that you will experience no other way. There is fruit within the realm of commitment that you will experience and receive in no other way. That's why Paul is saying, put on. Now, some of your translations say, uh, take up or, or pick up. But ultimately, the verb in the original text is saying, this is more than just kind of admiring or thinking it's a good idea or holding it in your hand. It is a putting on that is similar to a choosing, an owning, and a professing. That it's not just uh, beside us or, or in the car with us or in our pocket. It becomes us. That we put it on in an integral way of what our identity is. And so when we profess or we choose, essentially when we are facing spiritual attack, then we begin to put on, to own, to profess the truth of who Jesus is for ourselves. And so uh, there are two scriptures that I find really powerful for us, and so I'm going to put them on the screen here. So Jeff, we're going to go to Hebrews first here. But in Hebrews, the writer is professing the power of Jesus, and he says, he says, therefore, since the children share in the flesh and blood, he also shared the same things with us. So as children, Jesus enters into flesh and blood with us, and get this, he did this to destroy the one who holds the power over death, the devil, by offering his own life, by dying. So we have this truth that as we put on the armor of God, we are putting on the person of Jesus Christ, the one who destroyed the one who holds power over death, the devil, by offering his own life. We begin to put that on ourselves, to own that, to profess that deeply with all of our heart and our passion. Because, as Paul says then in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, because, Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and in your heart have faith that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see what he's saying? He's saying, Put this on. Let it be who you are. Let it be the truth that you live by and you will be saved. Trusting with the heart with the heart, leads to righteousness and confession of the mouth leads to salvation. And not only salvation to eternal life, but salvation from our trials, from our tribulations, from the attacks of the enemy to pull us away. So when, Pete, when we ask, where do I start? What do I do? I'm so lost in this. How do I even begin standing up to these spiritual attacks? The question is, is responded to simply, start with Jesus. Start with the name of Jesus. Proclaim the name of Jesus. It's the simplest yet most powerful response that we can have in spiritual attack is to call on the name of Jesus. The one who has already won the war. His power, his victory has already stated defeat over the enemy. We're just caught in the battles that still uh, are going for each of our individual souls, but Jesus has won the war. Call on his name. He is sufficient. He is victorious. He is powerful. He is more than just a good teacher. He's more than just a great example or a wise person that we can follow after and say, hey, great idea. I really admire that. He's the one that we are invited to put on, to profess, to own, to choose. So point number three, God has given humans an incredible capacity to endeavor. 
We have seen the human spirit achieve so much over, over so many years of this trial and error. We have seen our capacity that God has given us to endeavor tremendously. However, the problem is, is that we get tricked into endeavoring in all the wrong things. And Satan says, hey, why would you work on that? Because that's just, that's no fun, and it's never going to actually make you happy, and someone's tricking you into thinking that's important. Come on over here, where the real party is, Satan says. And, and, and by the way, this will never amount to anything, but it's going to make you feel really good while you're uh, hanging out. We endeavor in all the wrong things, but the truth is, as we see, um, Paul isn't, writing to us and saying, hey, um, because all this spiritual warfare is going on, therefore, find a hole, gird yourself up in the, in the, uh, you know, the, uh, the baby posture, what's that called? The fetal position, thank you. You're listening, okay? Like, Paul doesn't say that. He doesn't say, like, hunker down and just, you know, he says, no, you put on, you put on the warfare, the armor, and go out into the field and fight the battle. He's not saying do it on your own, but he's saying you're involved in this. You go out because you have given, you've been given a huge capacity to endeavor for the right things. God is giving you the football and he's saying, look, hold the ball, run with it, and you will score. You have what it takes in me. Even if you've never held a football in your life, so do it. Point number four. Just because you've done something well once does not mean that you won't have to do it again. This applies to all kinds of life here. This is, this is life lessons that you get to hear at church that also apply to spiritual warfare. Um, look, we have talked about the power of prayer. Paul talks about in verse 18, he's wrapping this whole thing in prayer. And he says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Pray in on all kinds of prayers and requests. And be always praying. Keep on praying without ceasing. Paul is there's no mistake that he's talking about prayer here and that he believes that it's important. But the problem is, is that we live in a one-and-done instant gratification society. So we say, you know what? I was feeling the spiritual attack and I prayed and I prayed really hard. It was like three minutes long and nothing happened. And we, you know, we come to the pastor and we say, you know, nothing's happening. I prayed. But I don't think it's a mistake that Paul is saying, pray hard, pray like crazy. Invite your friends to pray with you. Lift it up continually. Write it down on the prayer request cards that people from your church may pray with you. Pray all occasions. Pray all kinds of prayers. Keep on praying. Friends, prayer is so vitally important. The greatest power that you have in the spiritual battle is the name of Jesus and his power over all of hell and death. And the greatest way to enact that power is through the power of prayer to keep Jesus near pray on all occasions on all kinds with all without ceasing this is what we've been invited into and sometimes we say you know I've done this once but I don't know in our culture if we can really say that we have dedicated ourselves to that because we do like instant instant gratification we do like things to happen after just once But in closing this morning, as we ask those questions, where do I start? Start with Jesus. What do I do when I'm so caught in this, or someone else I love is so caught in this, or that it's tearing apart our home right now? What do I do? Put on the name of Jesus. What scriptures do I go to? What scriptures are going to help me really defeat this and combat this and, and guide me in the right way? Start with the scriptures proclaiming the power of Jesus. And start praying. You're going to pray like crazy. Pray like you've never prayed before in the midst of these things. Invite people to pray with you in the name of Jesus to take on that victory. Pray in your own life that you may be a resistant to that. Pray for others' lives that you care about. Pray for your church. Pray for the good and the glory of God in our society, in our world, in our community. Finally, if you have any questions, continue to share them with me. They're on your response card. Hand that in during our offering coming up here. Let us know what's on your heart, what's on your mind, that we might continue to grow together in the midst of this. If you are interested in another deep discussion, you missed the first one Monday, July 2nd. It's in your program. We'll have another opportunity. There is, you don't have to come in being the expert. In fact, this deep discussion is for you to not be the expert 
and simply share. And so we invite you into that as an added opportunity to grow in the season and in this focus.